Welcome to the Church and Family Life podcast. Uh, we have Gavin Beers uh, with us to talk about this whole subject of modesty. Of course, the Bible has l- a lot to say about clothing, and modesty is a very, very small part of it. But we're here to talk about s- some of the breadth of meaning of the doctrine of clothing, and it's great to have Gavin with us. Gavin is a pastor at Cornerstone Presbyterian Church in Burlington, North Carolina, a great friend, a preacher at our conferences, and uh, man, it's it's just so good to have him here. Okay, so Jason, Gavin just returned from street preaching. He he was preaching the gospel, but you can't imagine where he was preaching the gospel from. Well, I heard it, so I can't imagine. You but. <laughs> can't imagine, yeah. So, Gavin, to you, I mean, we're to, we're here to talk about the doctrine of clothing and modesty and all that. But but you, I mean, just like an hour ago, you were preaching on the subject on the street in North Carolina. Yeah, I started at the beginning with the fall and the sense of guilt and shame that Adam had that was connected with nakedness and um, the fear of God that came into his heart at that point and how everything changed with the entrance of sin, that they were naked and not ashamed, but now they were naked and ashamed. And it's not just talking there of physical nakedness. It was like a sign. This physical nakedness was a new sign of the sense of his nakedness before God. And of course, the gospel addresses that in the covering that is provided uh, through Christ and his righteousness. So, so. They, so they covered themselves and then God covered them. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, they did. They had an instinct to cover themselves because they sensed they were naked. It's always interesting to me that it was a very um, minimalistic covering that they went for. Um, And the Lord said, no, that's not going to do. And he kills the animal and he takes the skin. And the idea of the tunic there is from like shoulder down to knee or something like that. It's like God saying, no, your works are like these little aprons, but I'm going to cover you completely through death and atonement and righteousness. Uh, So God is the one who has to answer the problem of our sin and our nakedness and guilt before him. Yeah, right at the beginning of the Bible, you have this this whole metaphor uh, of clothing to help us to understand uh, how good God is in covering our shame. Yeah, there's is it Ezekiel chapter 16 where you have this infant cast out to the loathing of its person. It's it's naked, abandoned, umbilical cord not cut. And God says, I passed by and your time was the time of love. And then he washes and he nurtures this uh, infant and then he clothes her that the shame of her nakedness would not appear. And of course, it's a beautiful, it's an image of God calling Israel initially, but from that, of course, we see the picture of of the gospel where God finds us in our sin, helpless, cast out, condemned, hated, naked, and he, he swaddles us and nourishes us and clothes us. And even, you know, connected to modesty, he beautifies us. You know, it's it's very ornate the way that he clothes this infant whom he saves. You know, there's there are many hymns that bring this whole thing out. Rock of Ages may be one of the most famous. Naked, I come to thee for dress. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Um, helpless, look to thee for grace. All I to the fountain fly. Yeah, you have that. Of course, it is that scriptural image. Um, you know that. Um, in our church, we sing psalms, so my mind goes there. In Psalm 45, you know the beauty of the of the bride who comes to Christ. Uh, she's robed with needle uh, work, and 
beautified and all the virgins follow her. And this is the one who has forsaken all to come to Christ who beautifies her and then her beauty is delightful to him. And we get those images picked up, of course, in, in Revelation as well. Yeah, the bride is so beautiful in Revelation. Interesting, you know, I was preaching through Revelation a few months ago. The harlot is dressed somewhat like the bride, but the bride mm-hmm. is actually beautiful. Uh, yeah. And and the harlot uh, will be yeah. slain. Yeah, two contrasts there in that section, Scott. You know, you've got the false church is a, a city, Mystery Babylon the Great, is a woman, a harlot, and the true church is a city, the New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, and she's also a woman, a bride adorned for her husband. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've had a, a couple of discussions or, or podcasts about uh, clothing, dress, modesty now. And uh, the thing that is striking me sitting here is, I don't know, we're six minutes in or something like that. And uh, there's been no talk of cleavage or, or mini skirts, you know. <laughs> um, it's so common uh, when clothing and modesty is on the table to just skip right to that. Uh, as if there's nothing more at stake than just uh, not showing flesh. Obviously, not showing flesh is part of the discussion, but it's not the, the discussion. Yeah. Uh, why clothing? For beauty and glory, Exodus 28. Hey, Gavin, let's talk about let's talk about the whole matter of clothing and the law because you have you have the ceremonial law and the law of the priests, you know, and then you have, you know, other things. Let's just talk about the clothing in the law. Yeah, you've got general commands in the law. Um, it's always struck me that where you have the, the moral prohibitions in terms of, you know, who you can marry, how close to a person you can marry, um, that sexual intimacy there is referred to as uncovering the nakedness. And so you've, you've got this intimate thing of nakedness and there are confines to it. So you've got that general idea where nakedness is brought in. And then you've got those other aspects of the ceremonial law uh, where clothes are for beauty and for glory. And particularly with the priesthood, they're typical of the beauty and glory of Christ. But yet with the priest's garments, you have the practical instruction that he's to wear these long shorts, I suppose we could call them, so that when he's working around the altar, um, that his nakedness does not appear. And so even in these garments, which are so typical of Christ, you've got well, okay, here's a practical issue that you need to address as well. You know, I wouldn't argue there's anything typical about that, um, but it's very practical. It's to preserve modesty, which would be in agreement with the whole tenor of the law. This man is to be holy as the Lord is holy. And therefore, yeah, modesty would be a big uh, thing he would need to preserve in his, his ministry. Yeah, he's to cover. He's to cover up, even if someone were looking up or uh, yeah. as he's ascending, you know, the stairs. The ty- this type of thing. Um, and again, he's a man, Scott. You know, right. uh, where we there you tend go. to think of, well, this is a woman thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Most most of what the Bible says about modesty isn't like what you. We're talking about skirt lengths and cleavage. It does include that, but it's you know, most of the texts are addressed to both women, men and women. You, you have this principle, don't you, that even going back to Genesis chapter 3, everything has changed with the entrance of sin. That the same thing is now different. You know, the man and the woman are equally naked, they're equally unashamed, and now sin has brought in uh, a perversion of our hearts so that the same thing for each person, man and woman, 
uh, is now a, a shameful thing if it's not found in a particular context. And, you know, the male-female thing's interesting because there is truth that men and women are different. And men tend to get the, the bad press on this one. They're more visual and therefore um, attracted to physical form and that immodesty would be a greater problem to them. But sometimes when we speak of that, it's almost as if it's not a problem to women and that women are to dress in a certain way to protect men. and. There's truth in that as well. But modesty has to begin with who we are before God, irrespective of if we're men or women. It's we're sinners before God, and he requires us to wear clothing for a particular purpose now in our fallen state. It is interesting the, the both the man and the woman are clothed the same way, but you kind of have these double standards, you know, out there. Like, for example, uh, you know, if you would say a woman should be covered from her shoulders to her knees, well, a man doesn't have to do that at the beach. I mean, he can tear off his shirt and be unclothed. You know, what are your thoughts about that? Well, uh, I think it's separated from history. You know, I think it was up until about the 1920s or 30s in this country. If a man had his T-shirt off at the beach, it would have been a, um, a civil offense. So sometimes we speak from the age we live in, which is dislocated from everything else. And uh, as a result, we don't have a proper perspective on things. Uh, we, we have a common pastor friend. He's pastoring down in Fayetteville. Uh, their family would go to the beach every summer, extended family. Uh, so, you know, entrenched family tradition. And his five-year-old son one year says, uh, <clears throat> Dad, why is everybody in their underwear? Of course, it's it's not underwear. Um, in some cases, it's it's less than we wear in terms of our underwear. But we, uh, because it's the beach, and because these things are entrenched in how we grew up, we don't think of it that way. But if somebody was dressed that way, you know, in uh, downtown, uh, it would seem very out of place. But because it's out of the beach, it's in place. Yeah, I remember when I became a Christian, and before that, these things were never in my mind, and. It then became an issue, and I would would speak to Christians who they hadn't even thought about this, and this was just normal. It wasn't deemed anything that Christians should be different in. And I remember thinking, and it's it's not an image that I want to conjure up in people's minds, but you know, I challenged uh, a lady on this question. I said, you know, if I happen to accidentally burst into your bedroom when you were changing and you were wearing your underwear, you would start screaming, get out, get out. And your instinct would be, be to cover over. But you put a pattern on it. You call it a bikini. And now you walk about on the, the beach with it. You know, can you not see there's a, a problem in your thinking? And um, in the Lord's mercy, the woman understood what I was saying. <laughs> So, uh, so here's a classic uh, New Testament text on the uh, the topic. It's First uh, Peter three three and four, where Paul writes, uh, "Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God." So, uh, Gavin, I think you were sort of uh, getting at this earlier. Uh, the things that we ought to be known by as sons and daughters of God are internal things. And uh, even, even setting immodesty aside, the way that, the way that we can dress, uh, even if it's not immodesty, it, it can, can make us known for very external things. And, and Paul is calling for something very different here that our, our adornment wouldn't be merely outward or just outward, but that we would be known for uh, an incorruptible beauty that God is able to give us. Yeah, I think it's vital. You know, we have a legalistic tendency. So 
even when Christians are starting to move in the right direction in their thinking about issues of modesty, we can fall into a kind of checklist Christianity. Well, got the right skirt length, things are covered, and so forth. But with the whole of our sanctification, it has to be from the inward out. And even if you take the word modesty, it actually roots the whole discussion in an inward disposition because modesty is first a spirit that we should have. You know, contrary to say pride, be linked with humility. You know, we talk of a modest person, person who's not showing off. Yeah. So someone who's talking about themselves all the time, boasting, he would say that that's that's immodest. Um, but then you take the same principle and you apply it to clothing, which is in some ways it externalizes who we are. Um, clothes communicate. So policeman wears a certain set of clothes, communicates who he is. Ministers in the past have worn certain clothes to communicate who they are. And so what we put on communicates something about who we are and, and where our heart is. And so you can have a modest clothing in, in the sense that it's flamboyant and we're concerned about the latest fashions and having the right labels and we get duped to be billboards for the companies who charge us loads of money to buy their product so we can walk about with their name right across our our chest because that's that's the thing that you have to have so we're showing off in look at my label look at the prestige of what i can wear and then when it comes to what people normally think about immodest clothing we're showing off again we're showing off our bodies in a way that would be designed to draw attention to ourselves, whether it be a guy who's, you know, the gym goer and he's got this physique that he's proud of. Well, he kind of modestly show that off so that people look at him and say, wow, look at that body. And then the woman who's wanting to show off her, uh, her body so as to receive flattery and attention from someone else. But all of that to say is that it's actually a hard matter. What is it behind the clothes that we're wearing that is driving us to dress in that particular way? So uh, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot uh, thought deeply about these things as they were uh, as they were courting in college and trying to decide uh, whether uh, they ought to remain single or to get married. And I'm I'm going to give a quote. It's uh, it's a loose quote because I don't have it in front of me, and it it goes years back. I think it's from a book actually of uh, Jim Elliot diary entries, but this will be really close to what he actually said. Um, Uh, He said, if lust is spiritual adultery, then immodesty is spiritual seduction, which I think is a helpful way to think about it because no one uh, wants to argue whether or not lust is spiritual adultery. Jesus has already rendered a verdict on that in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, But the, the thing that uh, couples it to a modesty is that if that's spiritual adultery, then it is uh, spiritual seduction to dress in a way that would would draw someone to to lust. Yeah, and that connects really to the law, which Scott was talking about earlier. The law and how how it deals with this, and you know the the seventh commandment summary command dealing with all of our lawful sexual relations and sinful sexual desires and actions. Um, when when that's parsed out in the Westminster Larger Catechism, um, it includes both in the duties that are required and the sins that are forbidden, the question of modest apparel. You know, we 
we are duty bound to dress modestly. We are forbidden to dress immodestly. But why is that? Well, the fundamental issue there is that it's a moral commandment that we are to preserve our own chastity and the chastity of others. So there you've got in the law, um, second table dealing with our human relationships, something that is also somewhat reflective of the second commandment and idolatry and spiritual fornication and spiritual harlotry and seduction. Now it's going on uh, between man and man. And to step back from that to what Christ says, you know, the two great commandments, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. So the seventh commandment teaches us to love ourselves biblically and to love our neighbor as ourself in this area of how we dress so that we preserve. In love to ourselves, we preserve our own chastity. In love to others, we dress in a way that's going to preserve their chastity. Gavin, chastity is not a word that we use a lot now. Do you? Would you? Are, are you saying anything more than sexual purity when you when you say chastity, or is that? Yes, yeah, preserving. Um, well, you you talk about the chaste virgin. This would be uh, obviously the person, the woman who's not been with a man. So sexual purity. Um, obviously avoiding what we would call fornication before marriage and any manifestation of adultery within marriage. So, so mind and body. Yeah, chaste in our relationships. So in love to ourselves before God, this issue of apparel is key. In love to others as ourself, that we would do to them as we would have them do to us. Um, we would dress so as to love them. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I read an article a few years ago by a woman who became somewhat controversial. And the whole argument was the problem is men. And it was a defense of beach attire and Christian women should be able to wear this uh, with, without a conscience uh, issue. And I, I was thinking about that and, you know, her argument was the problem was with men. Men have the lust. They need to deal with their sin. They can't blame women. Well, step back from that. Let's take it to full-on nakedness, right? Are we going to justify full-on nakedness? Because the problem is with man. He should be able to look at this nakedness and not have a problem. Are we going to justify uh, that and put the blame on the one who struggles? Well, I think most people would say, no, no, we wouldn't do that. We would draw a line there. But once you do that, you've already conceded the principle that there is a manifestation of nakedness, not covered modestly, that is problematic to another person when it comes to their sin. So if I love that person, I will dress in a way that I'm not going to be a uh, temptation, a stumbling block uh, to that person's chastity in mind or in action. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about the word modesty briefly, uh, you know, a few minutes ago. And you know what, you know, what I would, what I would pray we would do is when we stand in front of the mirror, we say, Lord, how do I, uh, you know, how do I demonstrate these robes of righteousness? But modesty is something, you know, of the heart, like you had pointed out. And, you know, modesty in speech, behavior, you know, there, there's a whole range of outward behaviors that flow from immodesty, not just, not just in clothing, not just in alluring clothing, but it's actually a, a category that, that governs, it's a quality that governs all kinds of behaviors, not just how you dress. Yeah, it's we we live in an immodest society increasingly. And one thing I was saying today in preaching on the street is Adam and Eve are gripped with the fear of God 
because of their nakedness and they immediately instinctively try to cover up. As far as we live in a culture that is publicly undressing itself, you know, and becoming increasingly immodest, that's a siren call saying there is no fear of God before their eyes. Because the instinct was to clothe as soon as Adam and Eve felt uh, the shame of their nakedness. But linked to the issues of the heart and immodesty, you know, we can think of it in terms of clothing, but we can also have immodest thoughts, we can have immodest speech. And increasingly today, we've got what I would call increasing emotional immodesty. And so Christians are concerned with the uncovering and the revealing of the body. And we're glad they're concerned about that. Within marriage, a husband and wife can be naked and not ashamed. There's a context for uncovering and revealing yourself physically to one another. But one thing that I see with the, the rise of the social media age is that people are more and more emotionally immodest. So if you maybe think of it as the undressing of the soul, there's no discretion. Um, everything hangs out. All of our feelings are are plastered on Facebook for everyone to to see. And I I've warned my own congregation about this that this is this is actually emotional immodesty. You're undressing your soul uh, publicly to the world, and. That's also connected to intimacy. I warned my daughter about this. You know, when you think about um, forming a relationship towards moving to marriage, you know, I hope you know, and she does, you're not going to undress your body in front of this, this, this man until he is your husband. But care is also needed in that pre-marriage relationship to manage how much you would immodestly undress your soul. Um, suppose you don't get married. There's a huge amount of intimacy that can be um, revealed if there's a lack of distress, discretion and a careless management of that. And then even in marriage, there's that constant revealing off ourselves one another to our husband or to our wife but now we have the context for it this covenant life partner that we can be emotionally intimate with which is actually the bedrock of physical intimacy um but again those things go together and people don't tend to think of okay well i could just be completely undressing myself in a spiritual or emotional way that perhaps I need to take care with. And I, I, our forefathers, I believe, understood that better. Yeah. Amen. You know, I, I was really, um, uh, really touched by that in Jeff Pollard's book, The Public Undressing of America. Great, great treatise on the whole doctrine of clothing and modesty. But he, he spends quite a bit of time talking about that word modesty. It's a great place to go to understand that. Well, there's so much more to say about this, but I think we've about run out of time. But Gavin, thank you so much for joining us on 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 such an unusual topic, but it has tremendous depth, much more depth than people think. Yeah, always a pleasure, Scott. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on the Church and Family Life podcast and hope you can join us next time. Church and Family Life is proclaiming the sufficiency of Scripture by helping build strong families and strong churches. If you found this resource helpful, we encourage you to check out churchandfamilylife.com.